Come fly Etihad Economy Class with me. We're starting with their worst and ending with their best. How do they stack up against their regional competitors these days? Especially with a beautiful new hub airport. Let's find out. Okay, it's 7 a.m. here in Delhi. Just had three hours of sleep. About to go check in. And uh, my expectations in terms of not having issues are not very high. Just like Qatar and Emirates, Etihad only allows one piece of cabin luggage weighing 7 kilos in economy. No additional personal items are allowed. I am nervous as I head to check in because my carry-on is definitely on the heavy side. Wow, amazing. Checked in, not a single problem with anything. Bag allowed to take and uh, got a good new seat that hopefully has no one next to me. Next step, immigration and security. Okay, through immigration and security in 35 minutes, which really isn't too bad for Delhi. Now let's head to the gate for our four hour A320 sold out flight to Abu Dhabi. I haven't been in Delhi since 2019 and I'm reminded that this is actually not a bad airport. I used to fly through here often, so it's quite nostalgic to be back. So today I am anticipating quite an interesting four-hour flight considering that Etihad has ripped out the entertainment screens out of their A320s. So we just hope for the best. I brought along some other entertainment. I'm going to try to sleep because I slept like three hours last night. But yeah, it's an interesting direction for Etihad to take. And the question is, how low cost does the cabin feel? Here she is, our decade-old A320 taking us over to Abu Dhabi. What does she look like on the inside? You know, since Etihad has pretty much my favorite livery on the outside. Well, they have quite an interesting configuration as far as Middle Eastern Airlines go. For a region so focused on premium cabins, it's insane that this aircraft has just 8 business class seats. All the rest, 150 seats are economy class. There are two lavatories at the back, so the ratio is 1 to 75, which is really rough and will mean long waits on a flight this long. As always, the emergency exit rows are the best on narrow bodies and economy, in my opinion, since they have far more legroom and you're guaranteed to get to put your carry-on in the overhead lockers. Today though, I am in 23A since I've been on a seat block which has been approved. For $61, I get an empty seat next to me on a full 4-hour flight not too shabby. So what about the 60 second sight score? Well, Etihad has a great site and they make it really easy to manage your bookings if it's made via them or via partners. And of course, it's easy to book the flights themselves. Selecting seats also isn't too outrageously priced in regular rows. And I appreciate that they offer such easy bidding for upgrades and for an empty seat next to you like I did today. You can also purchase priority at the airport at quite a reasonable rate easily via manage my booking. Etihad really is a master of upselling. What could they do better? Well, I think they could make it more clear how and where to select a special meal because right now you have to do it under where you edit your passenger details. And oh, it would be great if they actually offered special meals on flights under three hours. But why don't we stop talking about this and check out what it actually looks like. Let's hop on board. Welcome to the sexy Etihad A320 cabin. When I say sexy, I don't mean it in a wow, this is an impressive cabin way, but more in a wow, this is a visually appealing cabin way. The obvious thing you'll see that maybe doesn't align with the image we have of Middle Eastern Airlines is that there are no personal entertainment screens. Besides that though, we have an awesome fluffy pillow, better than many airlines offer in business class, and a nice blanket at our seat. We also have an adjustable headrest, which is always nice to have on an A320. The recline button to my lower left is unlike anything I've ever seen before, although the seat recline itself isn't unlike anything I've ever seen before. When this seat was introduced a few years ago, Etihad had marketing pictures showing a tablet holder, basically what you see here. Is it just me or is that not actually installed on this seat? If you have a case on your iPad, you should still be able to kind of mount it in front of you, but phones will be tricky unless you have a dedicated product for that. 
The legroom can best be described in one word, Wizz Air. And just like on Wizz Air, there are individual air vents to help stay cool. Now I'm confusing you with the good and the bad sides of Wizz Air. With that, let's leave smoggy Delhi behind and fly to less smoggy Abu Dhabi. Impressively, the meal is served just 20 minutes after takeoff today. Since this flight is over three hours, I'm able to select a special meal and my vegan meal is absolutely delicious. I think almost everyone on board would be really happy with this dish, to be honest. I also love the high quality containers. The only thing that's kind of random is getting not one but two fruit cups, but hey, it's tough to complain about that. I spend most of the flight watching Formula One Drive to Survive, which I've recently gotten into many years behind, I know. But if you don't have your own entertainment, you can at least stream from Etihad to your own device. The selection isn't massive, but it's better than nothing, and you can even explore a limited drink and snack menu through this system. Even though you connect to onboard Wi-Fi to use this system, there isn't actually any onboard connectivity, which is a little bit strange. I end up just passing out for the remaining two hours of the flight since I've been feeling like the walking dead up until now. Soon enough, we touch down in a rather stormy UAE and pull up to one of the most beautiful new airports in the world. This terminal is so beautiful, it makes the old Abu Dhabi terminal that I first experienced in 2017 feel like it doesn't exist. Those were the days of me being obsessed with Nicki Minaj, thinking Lufthansa was one of the world's best airlines, and being able to take three back-to-back -back red eyes in economy because I was willing to butcher my health to just fly, fly, fly. Let's be honest, these days I even avoid red eyes in first class if there's another option. Okay, that is flight one on Etihad done. By some miracle, I managed to sleep like two hours. Even though obviously it's never the most comfortable sleeping in economy, I still think that was a testament to that the seat was relatively comfortable. Cushion was hard, as I mentioned. And now the greatest joy of all when it comes to flying Etihad is the new terminal in Abu Dhabi. It's unbelievably beautiful. Arriving, departing, and this is honestly not a bad reason to choose Etihad. That was Etihad's least impressive economy class experience. Are you ready for one of their best? Let's fast forward and check out their 78710. Woo, let's go. Well, hello from a different Etihad flight. Here's a little spoiler for a future video coming up soon. One thing I want to tell you very quickly, I talk to my family pretty much every day, whether it's my mom, dad, my brother. And the thing is, when you're in a place like the Middle East or China, most of the services that we're used to using to call, like FaceTime, WhatsApp, Messenger calls, Skype, all those things are blocked. So how do you reach people then? You need a VPN. And what does a VPN do? It basically tricks your phone or your computer into thinking you're somewhere else. When you're browsing, you can just change it immediately to USA, wherever you are, and then your browser thinks you're in the US. You can make calls like you would anywhere else. It's really a must have if you're traveling somewhere like the Middle East, or especially China, where things like Google, YouTube are blocked. How do you live without Google? How do you live without YouTube? I don't know. And as always, I recommend NordVPN. It's the fastest VPN in the world. They have a 30 day money back guarantee so you can try it out and you can get an incredible deal at the link at the top of the description. But that's not the only thing a VPN does. Besides unlocking services and sites that are blocked wherever you are, it can also unlock content that isn't available where you are. For example, on streaming services, you can just change your country. It also keeps you safe online, hides your browsing, from whoever can access that on the Wi-Fi network or data you're on. So once again, that is nordvpn.com slash nonstopdan. 
or the link at the top of the description. So out of Qatar, Emirates and Etihad, Etihad is the only airline I have not been able to check in online for. Perhaps it's because I booked this flight through a partner and that's why, because Emirates and Qatar, I both booked direct. So let's quickly do that. In addition to online check-in not working, their check-in machines are not working for basically anyone using them. This experience of flying out of Abu Dhabi is very different from flying out of Delhi. Okay, let's just discuss check-in a little bit. So first of all, those self-check-in machines were not working for a single person. I don't know which destinations they work to, but they weren't working for us, so we had to have someone come help us. Then the second thing we realized is that those self-check-in machines don't let you see or change your seat. So you print your boarding pass, and then you're stuck with whatever seat it assigns you. So he was like, yeah, you should have gone to an agent if you want to change your seat. And I'm like, what? That's also low cost vibes for sure. But we're going to try to change at the gate. Worst case, we can't. At least we have a window seat. It's all a bit of an adventure because truly, besides the airport, this doesn't feel like flying a full service premium airline in any other way yet. After a fast and easy security screening, I just have to tell you a little more about my check-in experience. Etihad has a really tough time here in Abu Dhabi because Wizz Air is just expanding like crazy, outpricing them, of course, on any route that Etihad serves or any route that they don't serve for that matter. So they're kind of in this difficult situation where they're kind of trying to compete with low cost airlines and the end result, even though Etihad's prices on many routes are not really low cost, the end result is that their economy just feels kind of low cost like weighing your carry-on bags, enforcing a seven kilo limit, which yes, many full service airlines have that, but I have flown Emirates and Qatar so many times in economy, and I don't think I've ever had my carry-on weighed, or at least had it enforced like this. It's crazy to think how much an airport can change your impression of an experience though. The new Abu Dhabi airport feels so luxe. It's truly amazing. This airport is genuinely so so stunning, definite winner of the three airlines we're comparing in the Middle East. At the gate, I'm greeted by something that is just as beautiful as the terminal, this green liner 787-10 that will be taking me on the 45 minute hop over to Doha. How unbelievably nice is it to have such a large aircraft on such a short flight? Not that this is the norm on this route. So, the Etihad 787-10 currently comes in a two-class configuration with 304 economy class seats. Those 304 passengers share seven lavatories, meaning that there are about one per 43 passengers, which is a pretty great lavatory ratio. Many rows at the front of the cabin feature extra legroom and can be pre-booked for an extra charge. Unless the flight is full, you won't get to sit here for free if you don't get really lucky, stay tuned. But other than that, I don't really know what to say I'm for or against here in terms of seating since there are basically just two massive blobs of economy class. As you heard me say earlier though, you might not be able to check in online. I couldn't on either of my flights and both were on separate tickets and you might not be able to change your seat at check-in. So keep that in mind as we hop on board. Okay, before we hop on board, I just have to show these awesome seat areas that the new Abu Dhabi Terminal A features in the gate area. The cabin on Etihad 787-10 feels a little cramped like all 787s do, but I think Etihad did a good job with a not so great canvas. The seats are comfy and stylish. All of them are equipped with USB and power outlets, the latter of which Etihad is removing on upcoming deliveries of 787s. I still cannot believe that. The most unique thing in Etihad economy on many of their long haul aircraft is the headrest, which I've always found to be more looks over comfort. Interesting concept. The legroom on this aircraft is about as good as this AI generated cover of their in-flight magazine. 
That's to say, it's questionable. I don't want this to turn into me pointing out just flaws. I'm finding them as I go along. But also, there aren't individual air vents on the Etihad 787. Kind of crazy to have that on the A320, but not here. On the bright side, we get these fluffy pillows even on this short flight. So, are you ready to depart out of Abu Dhabi? Let's do it and check out the in-flight experience on Etihad's shorter flights. You might notice, why did Dan's wing view change? Well, before takeoff, I figured I might as well ask the crew if I can move seats since the flight is pretty much empty. To my surprise, they agree and even let me move to the far more spacious seats toward the front of the cabin. The difference in comfort is night and day. The legroom makes all the difference and I highly recommend trying to prepay to sit here if you can. This is a good reminder that it doesn't hurt to ask nicely for things on board though, but of course, I didn't expect them to let me move, so it was just a really nice surprise. Even on these short flights, Etihad serves a snack bag, which is a cute concept. It's tough to complain about anything here given that it's free, and I don't blame them for not offering special meals on flights this short. You know what I do blame them for? Making 99% of other airlines look bad by offering Bluetooth connectivity to wireless headphones on their economy class entertainment system. The system itself, eBox, is way above average, so double thumbs up here. I should also mention this aircraft does have Wi-Fi, and on my shorter flight, these are the prices. Seriously, I barely have time to load the Wi-Fi page before we're descending and touching down in Doha. Overall, I think it's pretty clear how Etihad compares to Qatar Airways and Emirates if you've watched my previous two videos. That said, they are not a bad option if the price is right. Their hub airport is stunning these days and you're pretty much guaranteed to not have a bus gate, which, you know, that's a big luxury at Middle Eastern hubs. All in all, Etihad is a solid airline with plenty of room to further improve the onboard experience to match the quality of their hub, and I really hope they go in that direction instead of following Wizz Air's Abu Dhabi subsidiary in an economy class race to the bottom. But what if you don't have to fly economy and can get business at a very similar price, even without the need to sign up for any credit cards? All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining me in today's Etihad Airways review. Etihad, although their economy class is a little bit confused about which direction they're going, there is no doubt that their premium cabins, their business class, and their first class, which is now, of course, back on the E380, you can check that out in the card above right now, those cabins are going in a more positive direction. They're basically widening the gap to make economy class maybe not quite as good, while their premium cabins are getting better than they have been over the past few years. And the great thing is that it's actually not that difficult to redeem points for Etihad. Not only in business class, but also in their first class apartments on the A380, which are flying to London many times a day, but will also be flying to New York very soon. I redeemed points for my flight from Abu Dhabi to Doha because the cash ticket was like $300 on that date, even though the flight was so empty. But with points, I paid this much. That is an insane savings, and I value those points from Air France KLM at about $13.5 per thousand points. So take that times the number of points and my total price is basically this, which is a huge saving in comparison to just booking this with cash outright. So, you know, I've said this in a lot of videos already, but many people think, okay, I just have to pay for economy class, even if it's expensive. It's like, okay, $1,000 for an economy class flight, that's the price, that's what I'm gonna have to put up with but you do not need to do that. You can make summer 2024, for example, the summer when you start traveling comfortably and in business class. I've already helped 
200 people change the way they travel. I have so many people sending me messages who have joined my points master program saying that they've booked their first business class ticket. They've already taken their first business class flight. Many of them are saving 50, 70% compared to what they were paying before. And most of them got started with my free starter program at the link in the description below. You can check that out and get three videos going through one of the best programs. You can redeem for Etihad Economy through that, Air Canada Aeroplane, but you cannot redeem for their first in business, although there are two other programs where you can redeem for their premium cabins that I go through in the full Points Master program. In that program, which you can also check out at the link in the description below, I go over seven different frequent flyer programs covering over 70 airlines. And at this point, I'm so excited how many viewers have joined and actually been able to improve their travels. And we're seeing tangible results of this, which just makes me beyond happy because this is something that obviously I can't teach on this channel. There's hours of videos explaining exactly how to go from a beginner to an expert in buying and redeeming points for premium flights. You don't need to sign up for credit cards to do it. You don't need to live in some specific country. Anyone anywhere can start saving significant money and not flying economy class when they don't want to. So on that note, thanks for joining me in this video. If you haven't already, check out my Emirates and Qatar Airways economy class reviews that I published just before this. And until I see you in the next video, guys, fly safe.